Welcome back to Homesteading with the Zimmermans, where we work hard and play hard on our little corner of land in Iowa. My husband and I were born and raised Old Order Mennonite, or Horse and Buggy Mennonite, as some refer to them as. And although we are no longer part of that culture or community, we are intentional about passing on the old-fashioned skills of our childhood to the next generation. Hi everyone, um, this is Ruth Ann Zimmerman with Homesteading with the Zimmermans. And it is mid-September, and what that means here in Iowa is that we are in full speed, full speed ahead harvesting. Um, this is what I've done in the last couple days. And I have my recipe book with some jalapenos laying here to remind me that I really have to do salsa today because I have a bucket of tomatoes that I picked a few days ago and they need to be used. Um, but I am sharing a lot of um, little bits of information on my Instagram and about canning. And whenever I do that, my inbox gets flooded with questions. So the the whole reason i started this youtube channel was to have a place to consolidate information so i have a place to direct people when i get questions on my instagram my instagram is what happened first um, my instagram went viral soon after 2020 when i started gaining the confidence to show our less than average lifestyle. And I started getting the same questions over and over again on my Instagram account. So the first thing I did was I started creating highlights on Instagram, um, but that became very time consuming for followers to weed through the highlights and find the information that they wanted. Followers started suggesting I start a YouTube channel. So that's what we did and here we are. Um, so what this video is going to be is a consolidation of some of the questions that I get often. It took me a long time to be confident to sharing any kind of canning on Instagram, let alone YouTube, because the way I was raised canning with my old order Mennonite mom and grandma is so completely different in most areas in a lot of ways it's the same but there's also some very very different things um, that i do that the modern world does not do when it comes to canning so i would get a lot of negative feedback whenever i showed canning so i started assuming people don't want to know my way of canning canning and that was okay i just went on my merry way but slowly god has given me the confidence to um just to show things that i'm doing and saying you can still do things your way i'm not saying this is the only way and you're not saying that your way is the only way we can agree to disagree that this is the way i fill my larder with 500 plus quarts of food each year for my family this is the way i do it and if you want some of these tips then go ahead and utilize them if you don't agree with it that's okay i won't be offended if you don't agree with it instagram followers tend to be a lot kinder than youtube followers for the most part youtube followers are kind but some of the comments that i get wow Somebody recently made a comment that I sound very uneducated when I talk. And of course, at first I was a little offended and then I'm like, you know what, she's right. I am uneducated. I'm, I never claim to be educated, I'm just skilled. Educated and skilled are two different things. In the Mennonite, Old Order Mennonite culture, you only have the opportunity to go to school for eight grades. So I've only had an eighth grade education if I sound uneducated, just tell yourself that. So because I grew up in a minority culture, the Old Order Mennonites, I wasn't very old at all until I understood that people fear things they don't understand. So in this video, I'm trying to take some of the fear out of canning because the negative comments, the hateful and rude comments that I get on canning videos, I understand that those are just because people they're filled with fear because they don't understand 
how it's supposed to work. They don't understand canning. The other thing is that I grew up drinking raw milk and the minute I had reading comprehension to comprehend that the government, government recommends not to drink raw milk, that is when I started thinking for myself. I grew up questioning the government from a fairly young age. So that is one reason why I stick to canning methods that were taught to me by my old order Mennonite mom and grandma. If you want to follow everything that the government says to do, then this video is probably not for you. But if you want to fill your shelves with hundreds of jars of food, then you probably will find something of value in this video. Okay, I had to move to the kitchen because my cheese is ready to stir, but I will um, answer a couple questions while I am standing here by the cheese pot. Um, so let's talk about things, words and methods that I had never heard of before I got on Instagram and saw people's canning videos on Instagram. And they were talking about things like debubbling. Like I had never seen my mom and grandma debubbling anything. I never, the other thing is um, measuring headspace. I'd never seen my mom or grandma measure headspace. We just filled everything to up like to the neck of the jar is what my mom and grandma called it. And I've never measured to see exactly how much headspace that is, but that was just our rule of thumb is that we measured everything. We filled everything up to the neck of the jar. The other thing that I had never seen in my life until I saw people on Instagram was when you water bath, they covered their jars completely with water. And my mom and grandma never did that. You, you just brought the water level in your water bath up to the product line. Wherever your product was, that's where the water level in your water bath stopped. And they said, if you cover your jars with water, or if you put more water in, water will cause, water will boil over the top of the jars and cause the product to siphon out. And when your product siphons, then you will have product between your seal and your jar, which then can affect your seal. So that was another thing I had never seen until I saw people, other non-Mennonite people, canning on Instagram. Now remember, I'm not saying either way is right or wrong. I'm just telling you the differences between the way I grew up canning and the way the modern world cans. Sterilizing everything. I had never seen my mom and grandma sterilize everything. We of course washed all our jars in hot soapy water and then filled them with our product. But we used, when we were using new lids, and now remember, um, my mom and grandma reused every lid possible. Um, we only use, opened a box of brand new lids when it was absolutely necessary. And we didn't sterilize those. We may have rinsed them a little bit, um, but we didn't sterilize those either. We reused every lid that we could and then when we do, did need new lids, we didn't sterilize them. We just used them straight out of the box. The reason for this is when you're water bathing or pressure canning for that, in, for that instance, things get sterilized in the water bath. If you have your jars in boiling water for 10 minutes, even if the product is in it, that's gonna sterilize it. And your lids in that heat from the boiling water and that steam, from the boiling water, they're gonna be sterilized. So they never sterilized anything. And this is the big one. I had never heard of the word botulism until canning videos became popular on Instagram. And the fear behind botulism wasn't even part of my life as much canning as we did, nobody ever mentioned, mentioned botulism. 
So what botulism is, is a bacteria that can survive in um, a low acid, no oxygen environment. And the thing that you might not know about botulism is most healthy adults, their immune system nips it in the bud immediately and they'll never even know they had it. Botulism is one of those things that are only a concern for people with a compromised immune system. And all the, out of all the cases of reported botulism in the US, more of them come from, more of them are from Botox injections than from home canned food. So the botulism fear, like it's not a thing in our house. My kids don't know what the word botulism means any more than I did when I was their age. Okay, so now that we've got all that out of the way, let's talk about the basic equipment that you need as a beginning canner. Um, so let's say one of my daughters was, you know, living in her own home and wanting to can, and I wanted to gift her with the things that she needed for her first year of canning for her and her husband only. So she's not gonna do 500 quarts of food. Here are the things that I would gift her. Number one, I would gift her with a nice stock pot. And this is a 12 quart stock pot. This is what I used for the first probably five years of our marriage. This was my main pot. And the thing doesn't really matter what brand, even though I will link a couple of my favorite brands, but I thrift most of my pots. Um, however, when you grow up Old Order Mennonite, for your wedding gift, you receive a lot of beautiful equipment like this. And this pot was actually a wedding gift. Um, the brand is Faberware, but the thing to look for if you thrift them, a lot of my other pots I have thrifted, is you need a heavy bottom. Like it has to sound like this. That is a real thick bottom and that will keep your product from scorching. The heavy bottom stock pot is what you need and it needs to have a real dull thud. And I'll show you what the ones sound like that you do not wanna buy. So I have to use a stainless steel dish to show you what it sounds like when a pot does not have a heavy enough bottom for canning. I actually don't own any pots that have a thin bottom because they're good for nothing but boiling water. And I don't need any pots like that taking up space in my kitchen, but this is what they'll sound like. You can tell a difference that has a much thinner bottom and whatever you try to cook in here, especially if it has a little bit of sugar content like apples or tomatoes, it's gonna scorch the minute you turn your back and stop stirring. So only buy heavy bottom stock pots. So the next thing that I would purchase is a food mill like this. And if you've been here a while, you've seen me use this. And this can be used for so many things. Applesauce, grape juice, um, tomatoes, and this one. So you cook your product before you use this. So you, you would cook your tomatoes and you would put them through this and that would get rid of the skins and seeds. And it saves you having to peel everything. So you can cook your apples or applesauce, leave the seeds and the peels on, just wash them, cut, you know, cut them in half, cook them until and they're soft, that, run them through this colander. And then you'll have your applesauce or your tomato juice and you can proceed from there. So these two things, of course you'll need cans and jars and lids and rings. Okay, so let's say that you're making a pasta sauce and I'll link my recipe. So you've cooked your tomatoes, you've put them through the colander, you've added all your, you've added all your spices and herbs and you cooked it until it's nice and thick. The only other thing you need is jars and of course my favorite canning lids. I have had better seal rate in the last two years since I've started using these than ever before. So get yourself quality lids because that'll give you a much better end result. Let's say your jars are all filled. You don't need a big water bath canner. If you can't afford it, then don't worry about it. You can take your big heavy bottom stock pot, clean it out, and you can water bath can in here. You might only be able to get three or four jars in at a time, but that's okay. So a big water bath canner like this, fits seven quarts 
and it comes with something like this and you can put your jars in while this is setting up but also the this protects your jars from direct heat from your burner so that your jars aren't as likely to crack however here's what i want to show you this is a very thin bottom water bath canners usually have a very thin bottom because they are only for water you don't put other things in so if you have a very thick bottom pot like this you don't necessarily need anything to protect your jars from heat however if you're still concerned you can use a can lid and put your jars in on top of a can lid because that will protect them from direct heat so this is all that a beginner really needs these three things could can so many jars of food for you without even a big investment and i'll link um this and i'll link my favorite lids and we will talk about pressure canners a little in a little bit unless this video gets too long and i'm gonna have to make a whole new video about pressure canners okay let's talk some more about water bath canning so water bath canning is for foods that are high in acid so fruits including tomatoes are high in acid and you do not need to pressure can them so okay so let's say this pear sauce i cooked my pears then i ran them through the colander and made a sauce and then i put the warm sauce into jars and put the lids on and i put them in the water bath and all i'm doing is heating up this product my pear sauce was actually pretty thick so i know that it's gonna it's more it's pretty dense because it got beautiful and thick so i know that i need to thoroughly heat this product so that it's hot enough so that when it cools down when i remove it from the water bath it creates a vacuum and what that vacuum does it takes all the oxygen out of here and it also seals the lid down so a couple things are happening when you're water bathing number one you are heating your product enough so that it cools down and creates a vacuum and number two you are warming that rubber seal so that when that vacuum happens and it pulls that rubber seal down it seals and now and we know that bacteria needs oxygen in order to grow most bacteria we will talk about botulism a little later but all the bacteria that could survive in a high acid environment like fruit in fruit need oxygen to survive so when you create a vacuum that environment right there no bacteria can grow because there is no oxygen so in the case of my pear sauce um i kind of look at my product and i know like this pear sauce wasn't from the refrigerator it was warm because i cooked it it definitely wasn't hot because I left it sit in my pot. So I'm gonna look at this and I'm gonna say, yeah, I need a good 20 minutes of boiling water to get this dense pear sauce hot all the way through so that it, when it cools down, it cools down enough. The temperature difference from hot all the way through to cooling down is big enough to create a large vacuum to seal the lid and take all the oxygen out of here. I hope you're following me. I hope I'm not making this too complicated. I want to simplify things so that you're not fearful. I water bathed my pear sauce for 20 minutes. Who told me to water bath at 20 minutes? No one. I just looked at the thickness of my product and knew what temperature it was. I knew exactly how long I should probably water bath it so that this pear sauce gets heated all the way through. Um, so, but you can go a rule of thumb. You cannot, when you have things like tomato juice and here I've got chili base and pear sauce, you cannot water bath them too long. What's going to happen? It's already mush. It's already sauce. If you uh, like water bath it for 30 minutes and you'll be fine. Most products can be heated all the way through in boiling water for 30 minutes. So that's how I judge how long to water bath my product is how thick it is because I want this to be heated th thoroughly enough so that it creates a vacuum when it cools down. So 
Let's talk about pears and the other, what's the other thing? Pears, peaches, pickles, things like that where you wanna get them out of the jar and you don't want them to be mush. So with pears, super high acid, plus I add a little bit of sugar. You, I only water bath these for five minutes because this is liquid. So it only takes about five minutes of boiling water to get this liquid heated enough. This liquid is heated to boiling within five minutes. The difference between this liquid is boiling and room temperature is enough to create a vacuum. And the other thing is we're not worried about botulism at all in fruit because it's such a high acid environment. And especially when you add sugar, botulism does not like sugar. So I water bath my fruit for five minutes only. Peaches, pears, and pickles, I do even less. Pickles, I do like three minutes because otherwise they turn to mush. Peaches turn to mush, pears turn to mush when I do more than five minutes. And pickles, let's just talk about pickles. Pickles, because of all the vinegar you put in pickles, as long as that lid is sealed, you're going to be good. Botulism cannot grow in vinegar and because vinegar is so high acid. Do I add, another question was, do I add acid to my tomato products? If I'm adding low acid vegetables to my tomato products, I want to make sure that I add vinegar. Um, that's my favorite is to add vinegar. I don't want to um, add citric acid or lemon juice just because it's not the way I was taught. I was taught to add vinegar. So if I add low acid vegetables to tomatoes, then yes, then I do add vinegar. Otherwise, I don't worry about it. Okay, how do you know if food is safe to eat or not? Um, this brings me to another question. Why do I remove the rings from my jars? Um, I am shocked by the amount of people that do not know that you need to remove the rings from your jars. Number one, your rings can rust to the jars. You want to remove them. And number two, how are you going to know that this lid didn't come loose? How are you going to know that the seal didn't break? And then because the ring was still on, it resealed. That can happen because it's pressed down so tightly, you might not know that it somehow became unsealed and then sealed again. But if this becomes unsealed and there's no ring on it, back, oxygen is going to enter there and you will see things grow. Mold will grow or it'll start fermenting. And that's the other thing. If your ring is on and it's on tight, and this starts fermenting, it's gonna explode your jar because it's got nowhere to go. But if your ring is off, then this is going to loosen up and if it starts fermenting, it'll just come out the top and your jar won't explode and go everywhere. So how do I know when food is, when it has become unsealed? Almost always there will be mold growing on the top and I just throw them out. I don't even mess with them if they have mold growing on the top. Um, other times, you'll just know when, when it's unsealed. And if I have, if I open a seal and I know, I can tell that mm, that wasn't real tight, I always taste it. I always taste the product and if it tastes, the only, you'll be able to taste if it's fermented. Two things happen. It either ferments or it will have mold and things growing on it. You will know the difference. And if it's fermented, it'll be bubbling. There is no doubt in high acid foods, there is no doubt when it's good or not good. If the seal is broke, it's no good. Throw it out. If it's sealed and you're still suspicious, taste it. Nobody ever died from eating a little bit of fermented applesauce. Actually, it might even be good for your gut. Okay, another question was siphoning. Um, in my experience, raising, covering your jars with water completely can cause siphoning. And the other thing that can cause siphoning is if the temperature, like say in your water bath, if you turn your burner on high and so let's say this pear sauce was cold in the jar or room temperature 
and I put it in my water bath canner, turned the burner on high. The temperature of this comes up so fast that it causes it to boil over. So if this was cold, I would probably warm it up slowly in my water bath canner to keep it from heating up too fast and boiling. Um, when something siphons, it can cause particles of food to get stuck between the seal and the jar. Sometimes they won't seal at all. Sometimes they will, will seal, but your seal will not be as good. Like it'll let loose over time because maybe there's some particles under it. So if I had some that siphoned, they're sealed, but I know that they siphon. I always um, have those at the very front of my shelf or sometimes I won't even take them downstairs. I'll leave them upstairs on my counter so I remember to use them because in my experience, um, if it's siphoned, you're not gonna have a seal that lasts for years and years. You might have a seal that lasts for a couple weeks before it lets loose. And that was the case with my green beans this year which is a subject for when we move to pressure canning, which might be next week and I might be able to fit it into this video, but I have a couple more questions that I'd like to answer and then I've got to see if I'm about at 20 minutes. Um, so that covered siphoning. Do the jars need to be warm before you add your product? So the only time that I want my jars and my lids warm is when I am hot packing something. And what hot packing is, is say I had boiling pear sauce, I had a warm jar and a warm lid, and I filled this jar with boiling pear sauce, turned it on, turned the ring on, and leave, just leave it. I don't water bath it. And the temperature, as this cools down, the temperature difference is enough to create a vacuum and cause my lids to seal. That is called hot packing because you pack your things in your jar while they're hot. And that is the only time I want hot jars is because I don't wanna ladle my boiling pear sauce into a cold jar because that'll make me lose some degrees of temperature that I could be using to create a vacuum. So no, when I am going to hot water bath or pressure can something, I absolutely do not heat my jars because they're gonna like, okay, let's say I have more than fit into my canner. What is the use of having a hot jar if it's gonna sit on your counter for an hour and wait to be water bathed? So no, I don't heat my jars, I don't heat my lids unless I'm hot packing. For water bathing, I just wash my jars and fill them with product and then oftentimes because I'm doing 20, 40, 50 quarts at a time, they will sit for a couple hours and that's okay until I water bath them. Okay, another question is, what about using skins and seeds in my tomato juice? Um, so you can get, a, you can use your colander, you can use this thing and remove the skins and seeds. Um, the belief is that seeds can cause tomato juice to turn bitter over time. Um, we have not found that at all with when we use the seeds. And if you've watched my previous videos, you know that I use my Vitamix, put the whole tomato, skins and seeds and everything into the Vitamix and blend them up until it's smooth and you don't see any seeds at all. The other thing is botulism spores sometimes live on the skins of vegetables that come from the garden because botulism can live in the soil. Um, but we will wash them. Tomatoes are high acid enough that botulism doesn't like tomatoes anyway because botulism does not like high acid. So I'm not worried about botulism on my tomato skins. And like I said, most healthy people won't even ever know that their body took care of botulism for them. Their body's immune system is an amazing gift from God. So I just blend the seeds and skins and everything. And that is how I do 50, 60 quarts of tomato products in a day. How to recan things that don't seal the first time. Um, so the only time, okay, so pear sauce, let's say I had one jar that didn't seal and I knew that we weren't gonna eat pear sauce in the next couple months and I wanted, to, wanted it to seal, I would put it in a pot of water, heat, like bring the product 
bring the water up to the product line and I would re-water bath it. Number one, my pear sauce is already mush. It doesn't matter if I recook it. Same with any sauces, it's already mush. Pears, if these didn't seal, I would absolutely not re-water bath them because they're gonna turn to pear sauce if you cook them anymore. If this didn't seal, I would put it in the fridge and my family would consume it within a week or two. Um, so anything that's already mush, if you cannot posit you know, possibly consume it that day or the next day or even within a couple weeks, you can't put it in your fridge to consume within a couple weeks, then yes, re-water bath them. Before I would go to all the bother to re-water bath something, I would do this. I would put the product into a new jar and I would put on a new lid or put it into a different jar and put on a new lid and then try re-water bathing because very possible your jar might have a nick around the top or there was something wrong with your lid. Um, so remove all chances of it being um, equipment air before you decide to water bath it again and take up your time and energy to redo that. This is a very interesting question. The question was, if I did not have a big garden, would I buy my produce in bulk to can? And it depends on what your motivation is. I would have to think very long and hard about the money that I spend on buying bulk produce and the energy I spend canning it because we are motivated by two things here. We're motivated by growing things as purely and as naturally as we can, as organically as possible. So that's our number one motivation. Number two is to save money. So if I didn't have a large garden, then I would be lowering my standards of purity of our vegetables. And so then if I didn't have the opportunity for organic produce, then wouldn't it maybe be cheaper to just buy the pasta sauce at the store rather than spending the money for non-organic tomatoes and the other non-organic vegetables and then the, the time that it takes to can them. So then I would really question if it's worth my time and money to can my sauce or is it cheaper for me just to go buy it at Aldi's? But so I guess it depends on what your motivation is. But for me, I probably wouldn't if I didn't have access. So if I didn't have a garden, a large garden, and I was not able to find bulk organic produce, then I, I probably wouldn't go to all the bother. And I'm even very skeptical about the organic label. My brothers are produce farmers and I have seen what they are allowed to use under the organic label and no offense to them, I love my brothers, but I would think really hard about buying a bushel of organic tomatoes to can for my family. Number one, I'm spending money and energy on something that is not any purer than what I could probably buy at the grocery store. So that's my opinion. You do what works for your family, but like I said, we are motivated by two things, purity of product and saving money. So this question kind of goes along with um, the previous question. How much do you plant your garden for your family size? And how many quarts of food to can for my family? So because we grow all our own food, the question of how much to plant for our family size is never um, about how much food we need. It's more about how big of a garden can we take care of? Because for a family the size of ours that goes through, you know, the amount of food that we go through, it is very difficult for us to manage a garden that is large enough to grow all of our food for a whole year. So it doesn't come down to how much food do we need, it comes down to how big of a garden can we manage. Our garden is between, I think it's around seven or 8,000 square feet. And that gives us all the corn, all the beans, all the tomatoes, plus the other veggies that go with the tomatoes, 
that gives us all of that that we need for a year. Um, but potatoes, we, if we had more space, I would grow, grow more squash and more potatoes because we never seem to have enough potatoes to get us through a year, but we run out of space in our garden. And the other thing you have to realize, living in such a northern climate is we rarely can do second crops. So we have to have a garden that's big enough to get everything in at one time in May and June so that we have enough time for it to mature before our first frost. So the question is how much can we grow? And can we grow enough to feed our family? And how many jars of food do we need? So let's say green beans. We live in Iowa, so it's the land of corn and beans. Corn and beans grow proficiently here. Like we, have, we can grow green beans like it's going out of style. So if I have 100 quarts of green beans, I know that's two quarts a week approximately. So 100 quarts of green beans is plenty for us in one for one year but if it's a very good green bean year i might do 150 quarts because you never know next year might be a crop failure and then i'll be glad that i had those 50 extra quarts of green beans and let's say um the potatoes did not do well well we eat more other things than potatoes to try and make the potatoes stretch every year so it's less about it's less about canning enough food for your family and more about adjusting your diet according to what you grew in the past year. So if the tomatoes did really well, we're definitely going to have more tomato type dishes than we do on a year where the tomatoes don't grow as well. So yes, it's much more about adjusting your family's diet to what you were able to grow that year rather than canning what your family wants to eat that year. So where to store your jars of food if you don't have a cold room? And for years, we live in a 100 year old farmhouse and for years, we stored all of our jars on a shelf in the basement and our basement is very, very damp and that's just, that's all we had. So that's the way that's where we stored them. And the thing that happened is my lids would rust because it was so damp down there. And I wasn't able to keep food for in jars for longer than two or three years because the rust would eat through to the rubber and then the rubber would, you know, oxidize in the oxygen, in the environment. And then the seal would break and the food would be no good but it worked we made it work i was very conscious of that i only have two years until i need to start you know being careful because my seals are going to break but the another place that you could store the most important thing is to keep them out of direct light in the modern world where most homes are very very climate controlled so if you live in a warm climate and you have your ac running you're as long as you have a closet that doesn't get direct sunlight you're going to be fine with your jars stored there and how long can you store jars the keeping them cool like our cold room stays between i would say in the winter it probably gets down to like 50 degrees and in the summer it probably gets up to 75 degrees in the hot part of the summer but keeping it cool for the most part means that you're gonna retain more nutrition. So let's say that this pear sauce four years later, as long as it was in our cold room where it was cold and dark, you're gonna see very little discoloration. But if it would have been out in the open where it gets light, it would probably start discoloring after three or four years. And so temperature doesn't have as much to do with it as keeping them out of direct sunlight. And I would, I would say a closet where you can close the doors is a great place to store canned goods if you don't have a cold room. The other question about storing jars was, can you double stack jars? I absolutely have, 
but you need to do one thing, put a layer, a layer of cardboard or thin plywood on top of one layer of jars before you stack them like this, because what can happen is with one jar on top of the other, you can create pressure points on your lid with time that can cause this seal to break if there's uneven pressure points on this bottom lid. But with cardboard, that pressure point will be more even and the weight of this jar will be distributed better and you won't risk um, ruining the seal of your bottom layer of jars. When I have to double stack jars like that, I'm always very conscious of as soon as I have room on a different shelf to move the top layer onto another shelf because I don't like to do it for any longer than I absolutely have to. Another question was, do you can in two quart jars? I absolutely do. Things that I can in two quart jars are grape juice, and oftentimes I end up putting applesauce in two quart jars because applesauce I do at the very end of the canning season and I don't have any one quart jars left. I only have two quart jars left. So applesauce often goes into two quart jars and grape juice goes into two quart jars. I just adjust my water bath time to like say if I would for applesauce, if I, for a quart, would do 30 minutes of water bathing, if I have a two quart jar, I'm gonna definitely do 45 minutes of water bathing just because I know that I need to get that product heated thoroughly so that the temperature difference when I take it out of the water bath is great enough to create a vacuum. Okay, I have time for one more question. And that question was, how do I store my canning rings? and I use a wire coat hanger, bend it open, make it hook together, and that is how I store my can rings. I do hope that you found something of value in this video. I apologize for its length, and next week, I will try and cover pressure canning and maybe give you a tour of the cold room and how we put it together. Thank you everybody for watching. Your comments and love are greatly appreciated by our family.